So in this video, we're going to talk about collisions between particles as a mechanism for exciting and de-exciting electronic transitions in an atom. And the basic picture is that we'll have some atom over here with an electron going around it and some other particle over here that comes flying in. And we'll call this atom particle A and this other particle particle B coming in with some fast velocity. And this is going to cause a transition to putting the atom into an excited state with particle B moving off at some different velocity, B prime, which is generally going to be slower, and atom A is now in an excited state, which I'll denote with an asterisk. And in general, what is going on here from the point of view of energy is that the kinetic energy, where this MR is the reduced mass of the atom and particle B system, which in general is just MA, MB, or MA, plus mb. That reduced mass times the velocity squared, the relative velocity. And after this collision, the energy is tied up in a photon, or at least the potential for a photon. Uh, if we just left this atom here and it decayed eventually, we would get that photon back as the uh, energy of the, the energy state 2 dropping down into the energy state 1 transition, plus less kinetic energy now because this V prime is smaller and of course by conservation of energy these need to be equal so I'll write that up here to save for later and now we'd like to know what are the uh, rates of excitation of these atoms for a distribution of these particles B coming in so now the picture is that we put these particles in a box along with some of these other particle B's that are moving along in various directions. And what are the rates of collisions there? What is the collision rate per volume? Well, we've discussed in previous lectures that from the point of view of this particle B, the inverse of the, of the mean free path between collisions for a single B particle is given by the number of particles it could collide with, the number density of these atoms, times the cross-section for a collision. In this case we're talking about a collision that causes a transition from the first energy state to the second energy state. So to turn that into a collision rate, which is a, a number per unit time, we could write that the collision rate caused by a single particle B is given by the number density of A, the number density of the atoms, times the cross-section for interaction, times the relative velocity of this particle relative to the atom. And this is just the same thing as writing the velocity divided by the mean free path, which has units of centimeters per second over centimeters. So it has units of inverse seconds. So this is a collision rate. Now if we want to talk about the number of transitions that happen within a unit volume here, we also need to consider how many of these particles B are floating around in that volume. So for that we need the number density of B times this, this collision rate. So to write the same thing on the other side here, you have the number density of B times the number density of A times their collisional cross-section times their relative velocity. And these give you collisions per time per unit volume. Now I've got a bit of a problem here, which is we have a whole collection of these particles, but we only have one velocity here. So what if that velo what if not all these B particles move at the same velocity. What if we instead have a distribution of velocities? Well, in that case, we'd like to talk about the number density B as a function of, of velocity. So NB needs to become the total number of B particles times some, some function that describes the relative abundance of these particles at different velocities times some differential interval in velocity that we're looking at. So if we actually write that out, this becomes the number of densities of these particles, and then we need to integrate over the fractional population at any particular velocity times this cross-section here, which in general can be frequency dependent, times the velocity factor that was up here integrated over velocity. We're integrating from zero to infinity. Now what is this integral? Well, it's really just a weighted average 
of all the collisional cross sections as a function of velocity times the velocities weighted by the abundance of the B particles at each velocity. And that thing we could also call, we'll call it Q12. It's the collisional rate coefficient, and it has units of volume per second. So in the end, we have that the rate of transitions from energy state 1 to energy state 2 per volume is given by the number density of A, the number density of B, and this fact and this collisional rate coefficient, Q12, which is a weighted average over the velocities of the particles of the cross-section for collision times the velocity. So for an atom with two different energy states that its electron could be in, for excitations, we have NBQ12, which for any given atom determines the rate of excitation. And similarly, in that one atom, we can have collisional de-excitation, which is the reverse of this process. You have a, a slow-moving B particle colliding with an excited atom here, A star. And that energy gets transferred into the kinetic energy of the particle B. So the reverse process here can just as easily happen, where A returns to its ground state, and we now have a, a fast-moving particle. And for a particular atom, the rate of of that transition will be NBQ21, which is this weighted average over the velocities of these B particles times the collisional cross section as a function of velocity times velocity. But remember that these velocities in general uh, will likely be slower than the velocities of the particles on this side. So to put these collisional excitations and de-excitations in the context of some of the other mechanisms we've talked about for coupling photons into exciting and de-exciting these atoms, we can have a general form for a two-level atom in equilibrium being that the number density of atoms in the ground state times all the mechanisms for going into the excited state one of which is the absorption coefficient times the integral of the radiation field over the line transition, plus this other mechanism for collisionally exciting this, which is, as we have down here, Na times Nb. We factored the Na out here, so we have Nb times Q12. So these are ways that we can excite the transition. And in equilibrium, that's going to be equal to the ways that we can de-excite this, which is that we start with the number density of atoms in the excited state in a star, and then we have the various mechanisms for decaying, one of which is just spontaneous decay, one of which is stimulated emission, and one of which is collisional de-excitation. And I'm just going to write as a reminder here in general, Q12 is given by this integral. So over here we have the context for exciting and de-exciting an atom given both radiative and collisional mechanisms. And of course this assumes equilibrium. So now let's take a limit of this equilibrium where maybe we have a, a weak radiation field and our time constants for spontaneous emission are long compared to the collision rates. So essentially what I'm saying here is we can neglect the radiative terms here. And if we're in a collisionally dominated system, which really means that we have both a lot of particles to collide with, the number density of B is high, and that the collision rate coefficient is high, which means we have high cross sections for interaction and possibly high velocities. So if we assume equilibrium, which I will use an orange color to write with, so we're in equilibrium and we're collisionally dominated, then we have that Na and B Q12 is equal to Na star, the number of atoms in the excited state, times Nb times Q21. So how do we solve for this? Well, the first thing we can see is that 
This equilibrium is not determined by the number density of the colliding particles. The only way that this cares about the number density of the colliding particles is to ensure that we are collision dominated, which means it needs to be big enough that the collision terms dominate over the radiative terms. But given that, then this equilibrium does not depend on the number density of B. Now we still have a bit of a complication here, so I'm going to start writing out these Q12s. The problem is that each of these Qs, these collision rate coefficients, is an integral over the whole set of velocities. And as we argued, we are actually using different velocities on different sides of this equation. That the, the velocities for the particles that are causing the excitation are not the same in general as the velocities of the particles involved in a de-excitation. So the integral over V for Q12 and Q21 are, are generally, the Vs are different between them. They, that it's, the, it's only the total integral that's for which this equality holds. However, we do have a nice little trick that we talked about, which is detailed balance. Now, the trick of detailed balance, which holds for most systems that we would cook up here, is that we don't have to look at the ensemble for all the different mechanisms for exciting and de-exciting for all the different pairs of v-fast and v-slow. That The power of detailed balance is that we can set the rate of any excitation pathway to be equal to the rate of the de-excitation along that same pathway. Which is to say, if I write this out, that I can drop the integral over velocity and just talk about two different velocities, v on one side and v prime on the other, and that under detailed balance, these two rates will be equal. But a critical detail in detailed balance is that these rates only match over an interval in velocity space, dv on the left side, and dv prime on the right side. Now to start solving for some interesting cases, we're going to impose some more constraints on this system. So far we've just assumed statistical equilibrium and detailed balance. But now let's start plugging in for things like distribution of the velocities of these particles. So if we assume a Maxwellian distribution, which you'll remember said that we had normalization coefficient it depends on the temperature of the B particles, the three halves, times the count up of the degeneracies, how many different velocities have the same energy, times the Boltzmann factor, which is the kinetic energy, or the thermal energy. Then we can plug in for F of V on both sides of this equation, and we can drop coefficients that have to do only with temperature because they'll cancel out on both sides. So we end up with Na v squared e to the one half minus one half mv squared over kt one two times v is equal to Na star times v prime squared e to the minus one half mr v prime squared over kt times sigma two one times v prime. And then, since we've gone and assumed a Maxwellian distribution, which is telling us that we're in something close to thermal equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium we know that comparing Na star to Na, that they will be distributed according to the degeneracies in each state, times e to the minus h nu over kt, so plugging in for Na star using this equation, we can get the Na's to cancel out. We end up with V cubed sigma 1, 2, e to the 1 minus 1 half V squared over kt is equal to G2 over G1 E prime e to the minus h nu 2, 1 over kt times v prime cubed sigma 2 1 e to the minus 1 half mr v squared over kt. And of course we can't forget our dv and dv prime. And now the cool thing that's going to happen here is when we multiply this term here by this term here these exponents are going to add 
And the cool thing is when you add H nu to the kinetic energy term of this B particle after the excitation, that's equal to the total energy that there was before, which happens to match what was sitting over here. So we can cancel all of these factors here. And then we use one last thing, which is that because we have energy conservation, we have one half mv squared on one side, which is equal to h nu plus one half mv prime on the other side squared. We can take the derivative of both these sides with respect to v to show that v dv is equal to v prime dv prime. So effectively, after matching our differential intervals between v and v prime, we end up with collisional cross sections, which are frequency dependent, between these two different states are related to one another based on their degeneracies and their velocities. So in a future video, we'll talk about how to estimate these collisional cross sections for things like electrons that are colliding with atoms. And electrons are one of the most important ones to consider here because relative to a lot of other particles flying around, electrons move a lot faster, and so they tend to, to dominate the collisional rate coefficients. So those are collisional excitations.